Hey guys, and welcome to the final lecture for Greek mythology. Congratulations, you made it all the way through. Uh, I know the semester has been really wonky, but I'm really proud of you for sticking with it. So please, please, please do not let this whole sh debacle, these shenanigans, get in the way of your actual degree. All right, please, please finish it. Do whatever you got to do. Just get that stupid piece of paper. Um, I know that a lot of people talk about college degrees as if they're, you know, common, uh, like everybody has one. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, and this is the quantitative side of it, still only 30 to 33% of Americans finish a bachelor's degree. So that will always give you a leg up, okay? And if you put it off, it's going to be more expensive. And I know cost is a big part of your um, calculations on that. But um, prices are only going to go up uh, if history is anything to say about it. So please uh, be tenacious, be stubborn, finish that degree, okay? Um, I wanted to come back in this lecture to the kind of bring it full circle and come back and review some of the stuff from the very beginning and really start to apply it now because it's, it's hard to talk about these things on the first day of class when a lot of you have no real background in the actual material. So we're going to bring it full circle. So remember, we talked about mythology as being stories that we tell that create, sustain, and define identity, right? So these are the stories that we tell about ourselves to remind ourselves and other people and our community of who we are. Uh, and also what we're capable of, for better and for worse, right? Um, so these stories that we've been telling did that for the Greeks, but they continue to do that for us. Even though they're not part of our sacred mythology, they continue to inform us of who we are, culturally, socially, um, ind individually, personally. Uh, they create the foundations for our dreams and our nightmares. They create the foundations of our own society. So, like I said, this was an introduction to the material, and in order to work with it and explore what all the material has to offer, you have to at least have some of the building material in your possession, and that's what we just did. We got the building material in your possession, and now you can actually do something with it, okay? It's really hard, for example, to jump into calculus if you never had algebra, and you certainly can't do algebra if you never learned the multiplication tables, right? Uh, so this is part of that basic underpinning that you can build on now, all right? We have kind of gotten the basics of it, and we're going to build up. And so one of the things I, I put on this one slide here is the cathedral, right? And if you had walked onto that land a thousand years ago, you would never have imagined a cathedral like that being there, right? You would need to... You need someone to draw the picture for you, and in order to build it, you need someone to get the supplies to you. All right, uh, so what do we do with this information, uh, and why is it important, right? And this is a, a question that nags you, I'm sure, I hope, uh, throughout the semester. And I tried to express some of that in the beginning and tried to bring some of it into the lectures throughout. So we're going to start taking a look at that, all right? We have some walls now, and so hopefully you can start to see some of the potential for what this can do for us or what this has done for us, all right? The first thing I want you to remember also that we talked about on the first day is that we're all storytellers. Every damn one of us is a storyteller. And anytime you have people giving you data without a story, the data has no meaning, right? So when we're thinking about storytellers, we're not just thinking about literature and mythology and poetry. We're thinking about Einstein, right? So Einstein told a great story of how space and time are actually interconnected. They're not separate at all. And in fact, when you have things with enough mass, they curve space and time. And, and that's an amazing story, right? When you when, you're, when you feel like you're falling, you're not actually falling. You're being pushed down to the ground by space, by, that, by the mass, um, the, that curvature of space-time. Homer came along, and he told a story about war and finding home. And even though it was a fictional story, it gave us a greater truth, right? 
we all still struggle. Uh, we all fight our own personal wars. We all have these um, places where we are weak and we have to build ourselves up and we have to do battle. And then, of course, on a much more um, literal sense and slightly less symbolic sense, we have warriors coming home from tragedy. We have warriors coming home with PTSD and they're having trouble integrating, right? And the Odyssey is a story about that. So it's a story about the human condition. Joseph Campbell uh, is that last picture. He tried to connect all the stories of mythology and showed us that there were these really grand patterns, not just within Greek mythology or the Bible, but across cultures. There are patterns that stretch from Greece to India to China to Japan to the Native Americans to indigenous traditions. There are these giant patterns. I don't quite buy into his theory of the monomyth, but I think he is right that these patterns exist. And of course, he is pulling on Carl Jung, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So remember, the other thing is I want you to remember that understanding science and the human condition are not independent, somehow isolated pursuits, right? I've been saying throughout, and I say this in all of my classes, that this line between the liberal arts and humanities and science and hard sciences, right, and business and, and fine arts, like we treat them like they're separate things and they're really not. They're completely interconnected. And if you're even a good scientist, if you want to be a great physicist like Feynman there, uh, he's up in that corner, brilliant, brilliant physicist working in quantum theory and, and was just cracked open some of that quantum world for us. But if you're going to understand physics and how, how things work together, one of the things you have to do is you also have to understand chemistry and a little bit of biology and a little bit of geology, right? If you want to be an astrophysicist, you need to understand how volcanoes work because you're going to find them in other places. So you need to be a little geologist. If you want to understand the clouds that cover Jupiter, you're going to have to be a little bit of a chemist. Right? The same is going to be true within the humanities and literature and science. Again, we're all storytellers. And although we have accuracy in history and the sciences, we have truth in the humanities and, and liberal arts and, and literature, right? Uh, literature and poetry, right? So understanding the human condition, understanding ourselves is not a pursuit of a single discipline. Uh, all of us who specialize in this, we choose a particular lens that we work through, but guess what? I can't understand everything through that one lens. I have to use other lenses. And then I have to realize that other people in other disciplines have greater understanding of different aspects because they have different lenses. But then I contribute what I know and I have greater understanding in certain areas because of my own lens, okay? So, we well, want to remember like Feynman and even Einstein. Einstein played the violin. Feynman was an artist. Uh, so creation and artistic endeavor and creativity are part of that scientific venture. If you think for one minute that science is not a creative thing, you're desperately wrong, right? And the same is going to be true of business uh, and other uh, more, you know, mundane, practical pursuits, okay? Ah, um, so even though... Feynman was amazing. He hasn't. Re he didn't reveal to us the depth of our own soul. How courageous we could we? He didn't tell us how to be courageous and how to be resilient and how to evolve and grow as a human being and how to be uh, compassionate and how to be um, resourceful. Right? We learn those things from like Maya Angelou and J.K. Rowling. Uh, we learn about resilience and strength of character through Harry Potter and a beautiful poetry like Still I Rise, right? You, that's where you get that stuff. And you've got to have that if you're going to make a difference in any field, okay? Or in any way in your life, you got to have that. If you're going to be a great mother, you're going to have to get to know Maya Angelou's poetry and Still I Rise, right? You may ground me into dust under your shoe and Still I Rise, right? So that strength comes from that area, but it, it has to be mixed it all has to come together if you're going to have real meaning and make real progress, okay? 
We also find meaning, not just in literature and all that stuff, we find meaning in modern mythology. And I want you to continue to really be aware of that. When you, when you nerd out on something, uh, when you geek out, you're, if it's speaking to you, if it has depth, it's because it's pulling on these more ancient stories that are, that are really, really important. All right. Modern mythology is being created at a rate like never before, but audiences are also diluted. And I think that's something you see in the culture. Not as many people share a common story. We don't watch the same things together. So we're, we're kind of creating these little groups for ourselves. So we have fewer and fewer common stories right now, which is kind of a problem. Uh, it also means that stories are more personal and they reflect our personal anxieties, our hopes, our curiosities, the ironies of life, right? Um, they also help us ask personal questions and they reflect who we are and how we see the world around us. So notice I included here, not just like big stories like The Hobbit or even The Avengers, right? Picard is an amazing new addition to the Star Trek universe. Um, but I also included Min Midnight Gospel. If you haven't watched it, it's new on Netflix. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a trip. It's a, it's a, it's a psychedelic trip. Uh, but it, it's got underneath all of the neon and the color and the weirdness and the crazy symbolism... There is some real depth there, and it's a very interesting show. Uh, Wonder Woman is telling us uh, creating a new hero story with a woman at the center, which I think I've talked about before on multiple occasions. Archer is just ironic, right? How, And it really pokes fun at some of our old tropes, our old stereotypes that we bought into, 007, right? We still buy into that, but it's still kind of ridiculous. And another new favorite of mine, what we do in the shadows in the lower corner there. Um, it's based on a movie uh, by Taika Waititi. If you ever get a chance to see the movie, please watch it. It is, it is hilariously funny. If you enjoy horror and comedy put together, it is a great trip. And there's a new show out based on that. And these are vampires um, from the medieval period, but they are in the modern world living on Staten Island. And it's their uh, foibles and troubles and trying to get through the day and figure out the world around them, but refusing to change, right? And you see that in their costumes. They continue to wear these ancient costumes that uh, don't fit into the modern world at all. So it's a lot of fun. But it's another, it's another um, way to explore, you know, how we get caught in our own ways, how we get caught in our own things, how we, um, we might idolize being, uh, an immortal vampire, but it's, you know, they end up being kind of ridiculous because they're kind of clowns in the modern world. So take a look at the modern mythology around you and try to figure out what it's trying to say about us and what it's saying about you and your, your little community that you're, you, you hang out with and that you geek out with. Okay. So all of this is not a new idea, and I wanted to introduce you um, in a real way to Carl Jung. Uh, we talked about Freud, and now we're going to look at Jung. One of, he is one of the fathers of psychology. He is the founder of depth psychology, also called archetypal psychology. He's also kind of a mystic, uh, so he's, he kind of takes on this sort of mystical... Um, Element And for that reason, uh, a lot of schools of psychology don't talk much about him, but I, I found him to be very, very good for bringing a lot of depth and helping to interpret the symbolism and, you know, answer those questions. Why are we still telling the story of Theseus and Ariadne? It's a freaking old story, and yet we continue to tell it. Um, and if you ever hear references to Ariadne's thread, now you, you understand the reference. Um, he was friends with Freud. They had a falling out over, um, over the structure of the psyche, what they believed to be the structure of the psyche. And ultimately, it also had to do with um, interpretations and understandings about religion. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Freud's theory of the psyche, I wanted to review that really quickly. So for Freud, he has, you know, we're going to use the iceberg as a kind of metaphor. 
uh, which we did before. So Freud has the ego, this conscious self, which is um, above water and is very, very visible. Um, at right at that like kind of water level where you can kind of see underwater, you know, just a little bit, that would be the pre-conscious self or the super ego. And that's that voice in your head that maybe tells you you're not good enough, maybe tells you uh, that you are not, you know, you're worthless or you're fat or you're too skinny or you're not... Um, you're not desirable in some way, right? That's that super ego self. And then the unconscious fully is submerged underwater and not really visible is the id. And that's the one, that's the part of you that wants to snatch that cupcake out of your, uh, out of your peers' hands, even if you don't know them, right? They come into class with a cupcake and you're hungry and your id just wants to grab it and shove it in your face. Um, get chocolate frosting all over yourself. Uh, but your super ego stops you from doing that. And the ego is kind of working between those two elements, okay? Also with Freud, he was born Jewish, but he denied it his entire adult life. Now, people might say, well, he didn't identify as Jewish. Maybe he wasn't Jewish, blah, 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 except that his dad gave him a Bible in Hebrew. The only people who were reading Hebrew are Jews. So I'm going to say he was Jewish. Uh, he did not self-identify that way, like I said, and it could be for political reasons as well as professional reasons and personal reasons at the time, uh, but he did self-identify as an atheist, and he thought religion would be obsolete by now and a relic of our kind of primitive ancestry, and, and he wrote a book on it called Totem and Taboo, and he basically said, you know, religion's going to die out. We are a much more reasonable people now. We have engaged in the enlightenment period and we're going to be done with this, you know, shaman woo-woo stuff. Uh, he was wrong. He was terribly wrong. Durkheim said the same thing. He was wrong too. But Freud was also profoundly influenced by these Greek stories and we saw that in the Oedipal cycle, right? Um, for Freud, mythology was the expression of society's taboos, the things you're not supposed to do. Um, and the result of breaking those taboos was explained in the stories. So, like, Hercules had to atone for killing his own family. Oedipus felt the need to blind himself for what he did. Antigone would rather die than break the taboo of familial piety. And Cre Creon, the, the king that was, you know, punishing her, also paid for violating that taboo because not only did Antigone end up killing herself, his son killed himself, and then his wife killed herself, and he ends up with no family at all. He viewed, Freud viewed ancient mythology as the manifestation of our hidden desires and religion as a mass delusion and a paranoid wish. And the mythology was that paranoid wish fulfillment. Um, so, for example, he would talk about Oranus being castrated by Kronos and Kronos being castrated by Zeus uh, because young men want to render their fathers impotent. Uh, they want to take that power away from the father. And so these ancient stories about castration and taking away their father's potency, sexual potency, was that uh, taboo wish fulfillment. I can't do it personally, but I can read the story where it gets done. For Jung, for Carl Jung, this, the ego, the psyche is a little different, okay? So above the water we have, again, we have the conscious self, which is the ego. And then everything underwater, and, and it's, it's not a straight line, right? There's some level of gradation, right? It's not black to white. It's, there's a gray in between. But that's the personal unconscious. Now he adds to this, he says, you know what, but the water plays a part in this. Because we are connected in some way. We are all connected. And that's part of that mystical moment that he engages in. That we are all connected. And that is the collective unconscious. And this is the locale. This is the place where the archetypes live. So as a bit of a mystic, he embraced the idea of deity. Now, he didn't really call it God because that's uh, there's, it's a very loaded word. God is a very loaded word. As soon as I say God, you probably have an idea in your head of what that means. And he didn't necessarily mean that. So he called it the numinosum, that sort of divine, powerful, all-engaging, all-encompassing thing, okay? Um, 
so it's not a personal God he's talking about. And I want you to get rid of any idea of a personal God where Jung is concerned, okay? But that's okay. Because if you, if you do have a personal God that you worship or you, you, you venerate, that's fine because that helps you. But that's not what Jung's talking about. So for him, the ego or self had to navigate through the world of good and evil and transcend the forces around him that were kind of working on it, right, or her. Saving us from chaos and the struggle between the two forces, um, you have the God images. Now, and I'm talking about Yahweh, I'm talking about Allah, we're talking about Zeus, whatever your God image is. That's what's helping you navigate between the forces of good and good and evil and struggling in that chaos. And that becomes the, fun, the, the psychological foundation of the psyche. That struggle is the foundation and the archetypes in the collective unconscious appear. And they come out in mythology and they come out in the mystical experience and those become the foundation for our stories, our shared collective stories. So mythology comes from the collective unconscious and our cultural and sometimes personal reflection of the struggle between good and evil and our experiences of the numinosum or the divine realm, right? So again, don't think about it as a, as a personal God that he's necessarily talking about, but that personal God is a manifestation within my head, within my mind or my heart or whatever you want to say, of that numinosum, okay, that thing out there. He's not really concerned with definitions of God and whether there's one God that's correct over another again. Um, if one faith was correct or another, he didn't really care. He studied all faiths. He studied, every, studied everything he could get his hands on throughout his life. Um, and he built himself, um, it's at one point later on in his career, he built himself a stone tower um, as kind of a, a testament to his, his, uh, his faith and understanding of the numinosum. And he also had above the door in that tower uh, a plaque. And it says, Vocatus atque non vocatus Deus adderit. Called or not called. God is present, or God will be present. Sorry, it's in the future. So God will be present. So this ties into his, his ideas about the psyche and the archetypes and what's coming up from the collective unconscious, because you're always connected to it. Even if you don't realize it, you are connected to that collective unconscious, and the, and the, the archetypes are the gods. Okay, these, these kind of big patterns that... Um, surface through us and through our own cultures and societies, okay? And to some degree, I think he would argue that these archetypes are actually hardwired to some degree in our brains, uh, but obviously that can't really uh, be tested as well <laughs> as uh, one would hope. So what is the archetype? So welcome to archetypalism. We have from Jung, the contents of the collective unconscious are archetypes, primordial images that reflect basic patterns that are common to us all and which have existed universally since the dawn of time. It's the gods, okay? Um, the deities and characters in mythology and religion, as they are understood by us, consciously and unconsciously are our, are our own archetypes, okay? Archetypes are patterns and they interact with each other and they interact um, within our own psyche. And they manifest in all kinds of ways that can be per expressed personally in our own life as well as in the stories we tell, all right? Um, and in the stories we often magnify the archetype to make it really potent and obvious. One of the ways to think about the archetypes um, is uh, a, an analogy or a metaphor my sister came up with. Uh, if you have an archetype of, say, the mother, you would have like a glass jar that's like mom, right, labeled mom. And in that jar 
can be all kinds of things. And maybe it's filled with candy and sweetness and love and, you know, cotton candy that's fluffy and sweet and wonderful. Uh, or maybe it's filled with rocks, things that are hard, but very, maybe very practical things, lots of binder clips, I don't know. Uh, but can also be filled with poison, right? So like the toxic mother, maybe the smothering mother, or maybe the smothering mother is candy giving you cavities, right? It's not healthy, um, right? But, and it can be filled with a combination of these things, right? Uh, so how that jar gets filled and whether or not it's good for you is, is a question that you have to deal with in your own psyche. And everybody's vision of mother is very different depending on their experience, depending on what society has told them, uh, depending on what their faith tells them, what their culture tells them, and like I said, um, even within the family, what other family members tell them, okay? Some of the archetypes, and these are just a few examples, um, there are many of them. Like I said, this is only a few. Uh, it is not necessarily a, a finite or, or fully known field. There are, new archetypes are evolving even now. Some are more obvious than others. Some are more prevalent than others. They all potentially live within us and our mythologies um, that we continually retell and, and as well as those that we're creating. Right, so superheroes and Harry Potter, those are new mythologies. Um, they help us to find who we are and who we want to be, who we can be. One of the amazing things is that uh, is coming out of feminism, right? And when I talk about feminism, I'm talking about just a basic fundamental belief that women are equal and deserving of equal respect and equal opportunities and equal pay, <laughs> okay? So um, coming out of feminism, uh, is this question of the, the female superhero, which I've talked about. And it's basically uh, all, this idea that we can all identify with any of the archetypes. So um, a woman can identify with the hero archetype, a man can identify with the mother archetype, the nurturer, right? And that's a wonderful thing, as well as the LGBT movement, uh, right? And that's kind of the fundamental idea that all people are equal, and they should be able to identify the way they want, the way they feel they want to identify, and they should be able to love whomever they want. Um, and one of the ideas coming out of there is that any of us can inhabit any of these roles again, and we should be able to inhabit these roles and a number of other roles throughout our lives as we evolve, right? So they're really pushing on that. So a man can identify with the drag queen, which I think think could also be its own archetype, right? Um, there are distinct gender roles on the chart, but we are going beyond that and we have to continue to work beyond that. Um, so when I talk about remything, and that's something I, I say sometimes when we're talking about creating stories, I talk about remything, recreating those, uh, those great patterns. Right, so maybe, for example, we need to reimagine Ariadne not as the victim or the hapless lover, but maybe she's a trickster, and that might be another way to think about the Ariadne character, and we're going to talk about her later on. So take a look, for example, um, the hero is like this obvious archetype, um, that uh, gets brought up over and over again. Joseph Campbell did Hero with a, a Thousand Faces. It's kind of this really old story, uh, but it's changed and it continues to evolve for all of us. Uh, we experience different things from heroes now. We don't want our hero, for example, Theseus, to be a jerk and leave their helper, Ariadne, on the shore. Uh, that's not okay. And he is no longer considered he would no longer be considered a hero in the modern context, right? Our heroes today also need to be kind um, to those who, do, who deserve kindness and maybe even to those who don't deserve it, right? A kind person is a hero. Uh, different people can be heroes now. For example, um, we, we, you know, things that we used to consider monsters, they can be heroes. So we have Shrek playing the hero now. Heroes reflect the better parts of ourselves, um, and they don't shy away from complicated journeys of life. Uh, slaying the great evil, though, is easy, and it's black and white. Uh, sometimes everyday life is actually a little bit harder to navigate. 
being annoyed by your sidekick. And I know like, for example, Shrek gets there, uh, even in Avengers, they get there. Um, having to change diapers, even though you're the great savior of the people, you still gotta, still gotta do that day-to-day -day stuff. Um, wanting to go on a date with a decent guy, even if you have to slay vampires later. And I have a lovely, uh, a picture of Buffy the Vampire Slayer there for that one. Um, we like our heroes to be good people who are still challenged by the same crap that challenges us, right? We want them to be at least as good as us and, and, and a little bit better, right? We definitely want them to be good people. Um, another archetype is uh, the self, right? And so the psyche, um, and the word psyche, right, from psyche and, and Cupid, right? Uh, the word psyche also refers to the self, it's the ego. So according to Jungian theory, some of the most basic um, archetypes include the psyche, and that is that grounded sense of genuine confidence in who you are and your value. Uh, it's not based in how you look or whether people like you enough, right? Um, a wounded self or a wounded psyche can be expressed in a number of different ways. Um, an extreme way is through narcissism. And we looked at the story of Narcissus and Echo. Your sense of self may depend on whether or not the world flatters and worships you enough. Um, and in some ways that flattery comes because the world does not deserve you. They should be um, bowing at your feet because they don't deserve you. But the truth of the matter is, the truth is, in that narcissistic uh, psyche, there is not a strong enough self at its center to handle criticism. And any kind of critique becomes a major affront, a major crime committed by some buffoon, right? And they become angry, they become very hurt, uh, they can't handle somebody telling them, you know, maybe you need to do this differently. And they become extremely wounded by that. Um, a healthy sense of self includes an ability to be empathetic and compassionate, which Narcissus was completely unable to do. But the other side of this is Echo. And Echo was only compassionate and empathetic, and she didn't have a sense of self to get out of that. And when Narcissus dies, she dies with him, right? She doesn't have a sense of her own psyche. So she is absorbing the pain and she would change herself into whatever need be to be with Narcissus. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of women in society fall into echo at different times in their lives. Uh, when the person that you desperately want to love you uh, is into something that you've never done, but suddenly you're a big fan of it, right? Uh, you do things that, don't that aren't really part of who you are in order to get them to love you. That would be Echo. So she is easily absorbing and changing to adapt what other people want. Notice, she remember, she doesn't even have her own voice, which is not to say... Um, that you should never compromise in relationship. You absolutely should, but n don't lose sight of who you are, all right? Don't change who you are for the sake of somebody else's weak ego. Uh, women have, tr like I said, have traditionally been condi conditioned to be uh, echo, and men have traditionally be been conditioned to be narcissus, right? You, you're, you're a manly man. People don't tell you what to do. People don't tell you how to act. You know, you go off and you be de decisive and you make a decision and that's it. Um, whereas women are told to go off and be liked, right? Don't, don't, don't be too demanding. Don't be overly abra abrasive because you need people to like you. Another uh, part, another archetype that is very prevalent in Jungian psychology is the shadow. So the shadow is the thing you refuse to acknowledge in yourself, the thing you hate or dislike in yourself, especially you probably hate it in others. Uh, this is the thing that you fear, okay? So if you think about your grandfather or the person who really hates the LGBT community, uh, you have to question what's going on on the inside. Where do they feel um, weakened? to the extent that they cannot embrace this other 
idea, right? Now I've put up here three images. I have uh, the Minotaur in the center, and on the right, I have uh, the character of Lucifer from the show Lucifer. Uh, if you get a chance to watch it, it was really fun. It was a fun show. Uh, but obviously the devil becomes that thing that we fear and hate and we project it out uh, onto this character of the devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. Okay. Uh, if you become overly freaked out about the evil in other people or the things that other people are doing and you feel the need to condemn large swaths of the community uh, to hell, or you know, for example, um, and I would use the first... Baptist um, church, that Florida Baptist church that I can talk about occasionally, uh, who say that everybody's going to hell because we accept gays and stuff. Uh, you got to look in a mirror. Time to look in a mirror and see what it is that you really don't like in yourself that you're projecting out on everybody else. The easiest example of this um, is the, uh, you know, the, the person who is screaming and yelling about the gays, right? And the gays are terrible. And again, the was it West First Baptist of Westboro? I think it was, right? And we hear, we occasionally hear politicians coming, you know, screaming and yelling about the gay community and the LGBT agenda. And I promise you, they do not have an agenda. And I look at them and I'm like, you don't have a problem with RuPaul. RuPaul is just your shadow. I think maybe you want to be RuPaul, right? I think you might be a little gay. And you're afraid of that in yourself and you, you don't want to acknowledge it in yourself. And so you hate that in yourself and then you express that through hatred of other people um, who represent that thing, right? So that's the shadow. The thing you fear, the thing you hate, the thing you don't like within yourself is your shadow. And it's the thing that we keep hidden, the thing that we don't talk about, the thing that we project outward so that we don't have to see it in ourselves, okay? And then the shadow, I want to make it really clear in many ways, um, for example, Echo and Narcissus are shadows of each other. Echo falling in love with someone who, with an overly developed sense of entitlement, even though it's toxic. Um, but I also want to point out that the shadow is not necessarily a horrible thing. It's just the thing we fear, Right? The shadow might actually be, if you were to confront it, if you were to face it head on, might be fabulous, might be amazing, and it might be scary as hell because it represents the unknown, but it could also be the beginning of a great adventure, right? It's just not the stable thing we always do, and so it becomes a feared thing. All right, so I want to go back to uh, the labyrinth, Theseus, the Minotaur, and Ariadne. So the story of the Minotaur is a great way to talk about the self and its evolution uh, by encountering the shadow. So we're going to take a look at that in each of these elements. The first element I want to look at is the labyrinth, right? The symbolism of the labyrinth um, on its own is actually quite impressive. It's a winding path. And you have to keep making decisions about which way to go. Some paths end in a wall. Others will get you to the center, to the prize, whatever that may be, um, and, the, the, and get you to the, the next level. That's actually the prize, is being able to go on to the next level of self and, and evolve. Uh, this becomes a metaphor for navigating life, right? So these decisions, do I go to college? Will it pay off? What degree should I get? Does it really matter what degree I get? What do I want to do? Um, what is What should I do? And should I do what I want to do or should I do what I should do? And can I turn what I want to do into something I should do? Can I make money off of it, right? These are all the questions you have to, to kind of, these places where the, the path splits off and you got to make that decision on which way to go. Finding the center it always requires trial and error. Uh, you will fail and you'll come up against a wall. You will have to take risks and walk a long path that may not lead you where you thought it was going to go. Um, it may lead you to a dead end, even though you invested a lot of time and energy and now you got to go back. Um, but, let's see, uh, make sure I get everything. 
The other thing is that maybe the path to the center will lead you first away from the center, right? And that's the thing about the labyrinth or any maze. It can lead you often to left field, often to the outer edges before it takes you back to the center. And that's a risk, right? That's where you have to take a chance on, on taking that longer road because it could very well pay off really well in the end. You just don't know. Uh, but we're all wandering in our labyrinths uh, trying to figure it all out. Um, occasionally, um, I sometimes I feel like the walls are moving. <laughs> like I think this is going to go somewhere and then it doesn't. Or I think this is going to go nowhere, but then it does. Right? And I hate that, but, but that's part of the fun of it as well. Um, life takes place in the labyrinth and the center, like I said, just leads you into the next puzzle. Uh, you're constantly walking in the labyrinth and the answer is really never the end. The answer is only the next level. And the only real mistake you can make in the labyrinth is sitting down and not moving. That's the only true mistake. The next uh, character in this story I want to look at is the Minotaur. Now the Minotaur represents the shadow. Uh, your shadow, like I said, may look like RuPaul and you've been running from it your whole life. And really, it just wants you to be fabulous, right? Many of your fears are actually fabulous unknowns. Many of your fears are actually just new adventures uh, to, to go out on. Uh, they're not really scary once you meet them, most of them. Some of them might be scary, uh, but you can disarm those. Uh, and in fact, um, these shadows are multi-layered, they're mysterious, and they're very empowering in ways that you've never dreamt of. Most of us have trouble identifying our shadows, and you, that's going to be very, very commonly true. Um, they are shadows for a reason. They're hard to see. They dwell in the darkness. We put them in our blind spots for a reason. They're hidden away where we can ignore them for some time. Uh, because our shadows tend to be our blind spots. Um, and they, they tend to be in our blind spots, but they still belong to us. And we often readily identify them in others and we judge and we hate. Uh, we feel better about ourselves for condemning our own perceived shortcomings in others, right? If I feel that I am, um, if I feel that my, uh, my weakness for chocolate is a horrible shortcoming, I will never eat it and be miserable. And then I would probably look at other people and, you know, oh, how dare you eat chocolate? Chocolate is the devil, right? Uh, but the truth is I want chocolate, <laughs> I want to eat chocolate, uh, but I feel bad about it. Um, we feel better about ourselves. Um, oh, and we condemn um, our own perceived shortcomings, even if we never identify that shortcoming in ourselves, right? I may never realize that what I really wanted was chocolate. The easy example, uh, example of this, like I pointed out, was the um, closeted gay man who's actually homophobic, um, who condemns and, and hates and may even be violent there's something in there going on um, in their own gender identity. The monster is a monster, not necessarily by its own nature, but because it is unacknowledged and so it's pissed off. Um, it's locked away and it's pissed off. Uh, and so it demands a sacrifice for its food. Theseus's friends uh, come in before that and that's what they are. They're the sacrifice. We are constantly sacrificing things um, in everyday decisions that we make. Uh, the question becomes, is the sacrifice a conscious sacrifice or is it unconscious? Um, in an effort to further your, your, self, your goal of, of hiding your own shadow or are you uh, consciously sacrificing for some reason? Um, do you, so sometimes we turn away opportunities because, uh, because of our assumptions of the world based on, our, on the shadow. Um, and sometimes we run away from things that we really want to be because we're afraid and we don't want to take that risk. All right. So that is the, the shadow and the Minotaur in the story. The Minotaur is, is a wonderful example of the shadow and a wonderful metaphor for the shadow.
All right, the next character we're going to look at is Theseus. Try not to think of him as male, but masculine. So we're not talking about gender, we're talking about energy. Okay. Um, Theseus is the self, the psyche, trying to navigate the labyrinth. He is looking for the shadow or the minotaur. Uh, he is the hero, he is the warrior with a good cause. He takes risks by volunteering to go. He actually rigged the system to get on board the ship, remember? Um, he did not know what to expect, and he didn't know if anyone could help him or would help him. He doesn't know how he's going to defeat the Minotaur. He only knows that he has to go and try. So he goes into this mission blind. Um, he... He goes in because he's, he comes to a point where he can no longer sit, stand by and watch others go across the sea and sacrifice. He can no longer sit and watch the meaningless sacrifice that happens over and over and over, right? Um, and he is tired of living in fear. And he is tired of all of his uh, people living in fear. Fortunately, fate favors the bold. And we'll get to Ariadne in a minute. Theseus is, is flawed, though. Theseus is also a cautionary figure. Uh, the hero that is full of himself embodies the shadow and becomes the monster they forgot. Or not forgot. He, they become, and becomes the monster they fought. Uh, demanding sacrifices. Unconscious sacrifices. Right? He is too jubilant and he forgets his role as a son. He forgets to change the sails on the ship. Remember in the story, um, when Aegis, uh, his father, sends him out, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm raising the black sails on the ship. When the ship comes back, if you're on the ship, raise the white sails. If the ship comes back and the black sails are raised, I will know that you are not on the ship and you failed in your mission and I have lost my son. Theseus succeeds. But he's arrogant, and he is overly jubilant, and he is not a good hero <laughs> in the end because he does not lower the black sails. He, he sails in under the black sails, and his father, in his, uh, in his grief, uh, throws himself off the cliffs of, um, of the Acropolis and dies in the Aegean Sea, which is named for him. All right, finally, we're going to take a look at Ariadne. Ariadne fills an archetype so often portrayed in Greek mythology and even in pop culture. She's the freaking victim, right? She's the lover that gets killed, gets wounded, and in the case of Theseus, gets freaking left behind because he's kind of a jerk. Um, she is subject to the whims of her passion. She falls in love with Theseus upon sight when he, you know, disembarks from his ship. And not really thinking ahead, she betrays her parents and her homeland. Having given Theseus the red string and a sword that enabled the hero, Theseus, to complete his quest, they take off because part of the deal was, I give you the tools, you take me with you. You make me part of your family. You make me part, in, in Jungian terms, you make me part of yourself. We become a single whole, the masculine and the feminine, right? Uh, but Theseus, on his way home, they stop off on the island of Naxos, and she falls asleep, taking a nap, and he leaves her there, right? She's abandoned on the island. Uh, now, her beauty does attract another uh, suitor, Dionysus, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But I want to point out that this archetype of the victim is another archetype that we tend to live out unconsciously. It is part of our shadow, right? But we can still be the victim. If you know anybody um, who is constantly uh, being betrayed by all of the people around them, that is the archetype of the victim. Uh, and there are ways out of it, but it requires therapy usually. <laughs> all right? Uh, but uh, Ariadne does not remain the victim. She does not stay there. So in Jungian thought, she might also represent Theseus's anima, which is his feminine self. So he would represent her animus. She represents his anima, 
right? Which is, and animus, anima is like the, the spirit, the soul, um, the character of a person. So she is like his female shadow, right? And he forsakes her. He leaves her. Um, and so when he leaves, he is not... He's not fully cognizant of everything he's doing. He's not fully aware of himself and his actions, and he's not thinking about the future. He's not thinking about the repercussions. Um, he's, he's arrogant, right? And he's like, ah, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about it. I'm perfect. I did my thing. I'm the hero coming home, so screw you guys. I'm going home, except that he still screws up, right? Uh, he cannot live up to his full potential without both sides. You've got to be have a balance of the animus and the anima. If you are overly one or the other, you are in imbalanced. You're out of balance, right? Imbalanced, not in. Um, so we both need those energies to be whole. She understands the danger and provides the tools he needs to grow in the labyrinth. And leaving her on the island is a sort of regression for Theseus. He's, he goes back to that character that, you know, got on the ship to, to save the world, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, right? He grows on the island, but then he goes backwards because he leaves her behind, and he's kind of a jerk. But that's okay. We're going gonna to let that go. Let that go. Um, so he ends up killing his dad indirectly. Ariadne has the tools Ariadne has the tools to make things right, but she does not have the self-confidence at first to demand her rightful due. And she is literally unconscious of Theseus's plotting. And, and we see this symbolized by the fact that she's asleep when he leaves the island, right? He takes her on board. He's, he promises to make her uh, a member of his family, to marry her. And yet he has no intention of actually doing that. And we can be blind to people's intentions and, and the subtle clues that they might be leaving behind, right? Uh, the subtle lying. We can be unconscious to all of that if what we want is for that person to be what we want them to be. If we're not willing to look at it honestly and truly. And that's Ariadne's crime. She doesn't see Theseus for who he truly is. She is unconscious to that um, arrogance, that confidence, that, um, that vibrato, vibrato, right? And those are things that she really lacks. And now fortunately for her, on the island, she sees he's gone away and she is in mourning and she's crying out to Theseus, but then she gets pissed, right? Uh, and in the words of Anansi in uh, American Gods, anger gets shit done. So Ariadne gets constructively pissed off um, rather than destructively pissed off or impotently pissed off. She gets constructively pissed off. And in that energy, in that ability to, to, to do things for herself, she finds a new husband. And Dionysus comes down to her. A god comes to her and makes her his wife. So Ariadne... Um, learns from this whole thing and she finds wholeness in the divine realm with a god and she becomes immortal as one of the constellations in the sky after she passes away all right so that is kind of a an introductory analysis um, from a Jungian perspective so this is where uh, Jung gets uh, at least for me uh, does a lot to really bring depth out of these stories and helps me to really understand um, why we're still telling them and why they still matter. And I wish I could have given you this on the first day of class, but we didn't have the stories. <laughs> we didn't have the, the, the characters to talk about. So now you have them, and I ha I've given you a taste of what this looks like. Um, and actually, a lot of this is very similar to a lecture my sister Marilyn gives uh, to her first year students at Pacifica Graduate Institute uh, for the depth psychology program. So if you love psychology and you, you like this kind of thing, there's a whole program for it. There's a degree for it. Um, and Marilyn has been practicing psychotherapy for about 30 years now or something close to that. Um, so again, the Jungian, uh, Jungian take on it brings a lot more depth than I think Freud does. And it really 
at least for me, like I said, brings these stories, gives them a life beyond just being an interesting story. It, it allows me to plumb the stories and say, why do I find that story interesting? What really attracts me? What can I learn from it? What is it trying to tell me? And I hope that you will move forward and look at modern mythologies and even the ancient mythologies and ask those questions. Why are they still interesting? Why do you still care? Why are we still telling that story? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure to work with you. I'm, I'm so, I'm really sad that we didn't get to work together more frequently in person or for longer. Um, I'm sorry we had to do a lot of this kind of so distantly through uh, videos, but it was, you know, I haven't figured out how to work Zoom with so many students yet, but I'll probably have to figure that out next semester. Um, I hope that you will continue in your work. Uh, like I said, please be tenacious, be courageous. Um, don't sit down in the labyrinth and don't settle for uh, a, a half-assed, mediocre uh, ending in your labyrinth. Get to the center, get to the next level, and keep pushing yourself to evolve. Keep pushing yourself to the next level. You guys are the ones who are going to make a difference in the world. You guys are going to change the world. You guys are in prime position to do it. Um, the, the, the boomers freaking won't retire. My generation keeps trying. Uh, but the boomers won't retire and give us any space to do that. So uh, we're depending on you. <laughs> we need you. Please go out there, change the world, uh, make it better. And, and it doesn't have to be in big ways. All you have to do, all you have to do is be kind. Give people the benefit of the doubt. If someone's being an asshole, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they just found out that their, their dog died or their, you know, maybe they just found out they're ill. Maybe they just found out that their child is ill and give them the benefit of the doubt before you condemn them uh, and make this world a little bit nicer, a little bit kinder, and a little bit more willing to listen. Be the person that's willing to listen and engage in conversation. Be the person who's willing to make little changes. And if you have the energy and you have the inspiration to go out and do bigger things, go, do it, take the risk. Take the chance and go make those big changes, all right? We're depending on you. Um, so please, don't, don't pass it up. And please, if, if you ever in your future think to yourself, I only went to Cal State Long Beach um, and it's, I didn't go to an Ivy League school or I didn't go to a UC, who cares, right? Please remember that you will get the education you want no matter what school you go to. If you want a good education and you want to learn and you want to grow, you will get a good education. You will learn. You will grow. And you can end up in great places. Okay? Um, remember, I, 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 when I was at Cal State Long Beach as, as an undergraduate, I never, ever would have pondered the possibility of getting a PhD at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, it's a tier one school. It's the Harvard of the West. Uh, I, <laughs> who would have thought, right? But here I am and I almost flunked out of school. So if you, if you screw up and you're going to screw up and if you don't screw up, you're not trying anything hard. Uh, keep trying hard things, keep allowing yourself to fail and be kind to yourself. Um, when you fall down, be kind to yourself and, and remember that you're trying and that's more than a lot of people can say. All right, please stay well, please stay safe. And hopefully I will see you on campus later on in the next semester or the next year. Um, but go on and do great things. Bye-bye.